In the darkest corners of Nazi Germany, SS Obergruppenführer Dr. Hans Kammler was a man of unmatched intellect and cruelty. Kammler's twisted genius gave birth to the horrifying blueprint of the concentration camps, while his ambition drove the clandestine V2 rocket program. As the Third Reich teetered on the brink of collapse, Kammler cunningly amassed unparalleled influence. Even Hitler's chief architect, Albert Speer couldn't help but label him as dangerous and relentless. Yet, at the height of his influence, as the final months of the war played out, Kamla evaporated into thin air. The world buzzed with theories. Some speculated he died in combat, others murmured about a suicide pact with his wife, though she later refuted such claims, sparking suspicion of an audacious escape or secret deals with the Allies. And among the hushed conversations, a more sinister suggestion arose. Kamla had made it to the United States, only to face a fate darker than anyone could imagine. In the backdrop of a Germany struggling after the First World War, a young and ambitious engineer named Kamla sought to etch his name in his nation's history. From early on, his heart was full of patriotism, but fate had deprived him of serving in the Great War. Seeking purpose, in 1919 he aligned with the Rossbach Freikorps, a right-wing paramilitary faction born from post-war chaos. With them, he was plunged into fierce street combat against German communists, grappling for control in a fragile Weimar Republic. By 1931, the allure of the Nazi party ensnared him, and the SS's grip soon followed in 1933. With charisma and a keen intellect as his assets, Kamler's rise was stunningly fast. From heading the building department, he ascended to the pivotal role of deputy chief in the SS's economic and administrative nerve center. Here, he wielded authority over the SS's intricate finances, masterminding construction and operation of the ominous concentration camps that scarred the Reich. Disturbingly innovative, Kamler proposed ghastly solutions for the camp populations, overseeing the grim rise of crematorium buildings. His career trajectory veered into shadowy realms as he delved into the Third Reich's covert weapons projects. Tasked with molding clandestine underground fortresses, he was instrumental in birthing the Nazis' dream weapons. By 1942, Kamler's influence expanded to the V-2 rocket's production plants and the revolutionary Messerschmitt Me-262 jets test facilities. Unwavering in his commitment, Kamler's portfolio burgeoned to include weapon development and operations. In the hidden depths beneath the German landscape, the V-1 and V-2 rocket facilities buzzed with activity. These laboratories were closely linked to concentration camps, providing Kamla with a cruel advantage, a relentless supply of slave labor. Kamla was cold-hearted, pushing his captive workers past the point of extreme exhaustion, often to the point of death. When confronted with the idea of bettering their conditions, his chilling retort was, don't worry about the victims, the work must proceed ahead in the shortest time possible. Kamla's contributions made him indispensable to the Nazi war machine. But this put him in a position where he had to report to Albert Speer, Hitler's trusted Minister of Armaments and War Production. Though Speer valued Kamla, assigning him to spearhead critical construction projects the feeling wasn't mutual. Kamla had a thirst for more power and found Speer's oversight stifling. In less than a year under Speer's mentorship, Kamla won over Hermann Goering, the Luftwaffe's chief. Goering handed Kamla the reins of control within the fighter aircraft program, effectively sidelining Speer. As the walls closed in on Hitler and the Nazis, desperation set in. The intricate chains of command within the Third Reich began to crumble, consolidating power in fewer hands. Kamler saw an opportunity and seized it. He persuaded Hitler to shift the V-2 program under the SS's dominion. 
Heinrich Himmler, recognizing Kamler's zeal, gave him command over missile operations. Soon, V-2 rockets rained down on the Allies. By January 31, 1945, Hitler entrusted Kamler with the totality of missile projects. Yet the tide was turning. A crippling explosive shortage meant the program was on its last legs. As the end game approached, in a desperate reshuffle, Hitler transferred significant aircraft responsibilities from Goering to Kamler. By early April, Kamler had ascended to becoming one of the Nazi elite's paramount figures. Nazi Germany's fast approaching collapse saw Kamler constantly on the move. He darted from one hideout to another, evading the ever encroaching Allied forces and even his own superiors, whose mandates he increasingly defied. Amidst the chaos, Kamler made frantic efforts to relocate his prized missile program. However, destiny played its hand, and his specialized team was repurposed to bolster the dwindling German infantry lines. Kamler's behavior became increasingly erratic. He flouted direct commands, evacuated the Nordhausen facility, and sent his invaluable team of scientists and technicians into the shadows before he too vanished. Yet, his ghost didn't entirely fade away. British records, especially the continuous ones from Operation Little Foxley, a mission to assassinate Kamla, offered historians a fleeting yet revealing look into the enigmatic SS commander's final days on German soil. In the spring of 1945, Kamla found himself targeted for assassination. He miraculously escaped Royal Air Force airstrikes that obliterated much of the Nordhausen area, tragically claiming 8,800 souls. By the 13th of April, whispers circulated that he was in Munich, conferring with none other than Albert Speer. From there, the narrative grows murkier. Rumors had it that Kamler and his entourage descended on the opulent Linderhof Palace, a stone's throw away from a vast underground SS stronghold and the hub of the Messerschmitt 262 jet production in Obermargau. While there, it's believed that they stashed away a trove of critical research before hurriedly moving to dodge British commandos hot on their trail. In May, with Germany's surrender imminent, Kamler reportedly headed to Prague. The Czech capital was still held in the iron grip of German forces. However, Kamler and his trusted driver, Friedrich Baum, split from the primary group, vanishing into thin air. In the post-war fog of chaos and rumors, tales of Kamler's fate reach far and wide. One version suggests that Kamler and his driver Baum reached Prague, only to be ensnared in the tumultuous Czech revolt against German invaders. Kamler, so the story goes, took a bullet to his left knee and was whisked away to a hospital. Czech partisans allegedly overran the facility, killing Kamler. Yet hospital logs reveal a clue. A senior army sergeant named Friedrika Baum, bearing similarities in rank and injuries, was admitted to a military hospital in Comintern, Austria. Having been shot in Prague, he later succumbed to an infection. This has sparked speculation among some historians. Could Kamler have donned an army disguise, assuming Baum's identity in a desperate bid for escape? Some argue that this ruse ended tragically with Kamla dying of blood poisoning and being discarded in a nameless grave. Others contend that Kamla chose to end his own life. There are whispers that he made it to Ebensee to rendezvous with his wife, where both chose the bitter taste of cyanide over life in a shattered world. Yet another thread suggests Kamla departed Prague and, consumed by despair, either shot himself or took poison. His remains entrusted to a nondescript grave by his remaining loyalists. However, 1949 brought a new twist. A US counterintelligence corps agent debunked previous accounts, asserting that Kamla had been briefly detained by American forces, only to later elude them. From there, it's believed he fled to East Germany, lending his expertise to the Soviets. 
Many experts have doubts about the tales around Kamla's last days in Prague, thinking it might be a cleverly spun lie. This story would conveniently put Kamla's last moments in the imminent Soviet-controlled area, where prying eyes couldn't investigate properly. The Allies' seeming nonchalance in searching for Kamla post-war only stokes these suspicions. Some think he was already safely tucked away in Allied custody, a secret they didn't want the Soviets to unravel. Then there is a claim that Kamla was whisked off to the US and imprisoned until 1947. The tale paints a grim picture of Kamla's supposed incarceration, suggested he was locked away in extreme conditions, left to languish without any hope until he took his own life. Some declassified US documents give way to this narrative, marking Kamla as being under American custody by late May 1945. Another file even details an interrogation session with him in July of the same year. Still, amidst all the evidence and claims, the final chapter of Kamla's life remains a puzzle. Some historians lean towards the idea of him ending his life while under American watch in 1947, yet others speculate that this mastermind might have slipped through the cracks, eluding retribution for his heinous deeds. And what happened to the advanced rocketry and jet technology that Kamla had been managing? How did it shape the technology of today? I'm afraid that will be a tale for another time. There you have it. Where do you believe Kamla ended up? Did he perish from a nasty infection or wind up in America helping develop rocket technology? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. And remember to hit that like and subscribe button if you want to join the growing community that is Warhorse History.